I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. A beloved teacher donates her own kidney to save a stranger's life, only to have her own life snuffed out. Murder. She had to go. When police arrive at her home, it's a scene of pure horror. She had been stabbed multiple times in her own bed. There was uh, rage in that room. Who wanted Renee Pagel dead and why so viciously? There was a gentleman that lived next door. A neighbor or someone much closer, like her estranged husband. What would have been Michael's motive to kill Renee? But cops say he has an alibi. OJ had an alibi as well. Today, numerous a night on the case in Michigan seeking justice for Renee. Did you kill your ex-wife? Then one of the bravest survivors you'll ever meet. Shot in the head, literally one centimeter from death at the hands of her violent ex. I felt like this was it. He got me. Today, how she escaped her abuser as we launch a special new crusade. It's time to stop the abuse. Crime Watch Daily is getting involved, and we need your help to end domestic violence. Right now. Go, let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. If you look up selfless in the dictionary, you might just find a picture of Michigan mother of three, Renee Pagel. But sadly, just days after she gave the gift of life to a man she barely knew, someone would take her life. Our nurse tonight is in Michigan now with the details. In sickness and in health, or till death do us part. I would say there was uh, rage in that room. Did a woman known for giving life to others have her own taken by the person who once swore to cherish her forever? He decided he'd have to go to plan B. Plan B being murder. She had to go. She was a teacher and nurse practitioner by trade, but Renee Pagel was much more than just her titles. What just warms your heart when you think of her? She was so funny. She was always slapping her knee, telling a joke, kind, just somebody you wanted to be around. And that's far from just one person's opinion. Everybody who met Renee, they loved her. My sisters and I used to jokingly say Renee was out to save the world. Her passion was saving the underdog. She would give you the shirt off of her back. And a whole lot more than that. When she learned that the father of one of her students was suffering from kidney failure, Renee, who lost her own mother to the disease, donated one of her kidneys. What did this mean to your family? It meant you would have a life, you know, not hooked up to a machine. We would be able to do things. We would have our dad. Renee gave you that? Yes, Renee gave us that. Renee gave my dad a second chance at life. And if she'd do that for a virtual stranger, you can imagine what she'd do for her three kids. She loved her children fiercely. She loved them so much. But Renee's friends say when it came to the children's father, Renee's husband, Michael, things were a little more complicated. What was your initial impression of Michael Pagel? He was not as outgoing as Renee. He seemed to be a little bit more in the shadows where Renee was everybody's best friend. And after a few years of marriage, the disparities between the two became harder to ignore. When did the first crack start to begin? I wanna say about two years after Renee had their twins, they had had a pretty significant fight. She actually spent the night at my house and that was the first time ever but reportedly, it wouldn't be the last. I talked to Renee on the phone every single day. And we talked at length about her relationship with Mike. Renee was a little concerned that he had some anger issues. She actually sent him to a physician to have his testosterone checked because she felt like it was not in balance and perhaps that was driving his anger. 
Crime Watch Daily has not been able to independently verify Renee's friends' claims about their marriage. But according to her friends, Mike's behavior only got more troubling as time went on. She had discovered that he was taping her phone conversations. That's weird. That was very weird. That was the tipping point for me where I said to Renee, you know, this is very disturbing. This would be a deal breaker for me. Eventually, it's Michael who files for divorce. Well, he served her with divorce papers, and I believe that was in March when the summer he moved out. But the couple's problems didn't exactly go away when Mike did. What were the points of contention in their divorce? What were they arguing about? He wanted full custody of the children, and there was absolutely no way on this planet was Renee going to allow that to happen. And then he also wanted the house, and he wanted her to pay him alimony. Instead, what happened? The judge um, directed Mike to get a full-time job. They were going to be splitting custody with Renee having primary custody. It should be noted that in Michigan, where the divorce took place, family court records are sealed, so we could not review the documents ourselves. But Renee's loved ones say that was the judge's decision and that it left Mike fuming. She said, Chris, he's so angry. He expected the house, the kids, and $2,000 a month. And according to statements given to authorities, these were the thoughts racing through Renee's head during one of the most vulnerable times in her life. She was even worried that he was going to potentially come to the hospital while she was donating this kidney and do something to her. Renee did make it out of the hospital okay, but her friend Chris says that on the night she went to see her kids at Mike's, all those fears came rushing back with a vengeance. She's holding her side out of the hospital and he had the three-year-old on his hip. Mike threw the three-year-old at her and she fell to the ground. She believed that that was an attempt on her life. She was so scared. She was freaked out. She called me that night just absolutely horrified and freaked out. Crime Watch Daily did reach out to Michael for his side of the story. Through his attorney, he denied it ever happened. But Renee's friend Joyce says she also got a disturbing call from Renee that same night. She had begged me to spend the night with her, which was an odd request. Um, I couldn't because I, I had a commitment the next day on a Saturday all day, and I absolutely could not. Who knows how things would have turned out if she could have. But the next day, August 5th, Renee suddenly wasn't there. She was supposed to go with a friend of ours to a craft bazaar, and she never showed up. After several unreturned phone calls from friends and family, Renee's father went to check on her. And after that, lights and sirens. So when you walk into the home, what do you find? What do you see and who's there? We were greeted by her, her parents who uh, appeared very upset at this point. Uh, I don't think they really knew what was going on. That's when they led investigators back to Renee's bedroom. The bedroom itself did not look out of normal except for what we found with Renee. Which would be? Uh, that she had been stabbed multiple times in her own bed. A violent end for a woman who was anything but. And for the people who knew Renee best, there was little mystery to the murder. What went through your mind? What I, questions did you have? My question was, is when are you going to arrest Mike? Coming up. The last words she spoke to me were, Joycey, I can't die. I can't let that get my kids in my house. Did Renee Pagel predict her own death? Or there's a gentleman that lived next door. Does the evidence point elsewhere? We return now with more on the murder mystery of a Michigan mother of three. Here's Narissa Knight. Chris, Renee Pagel was the type of person who would do anything for you. In fact, here at this hospital, she had just given away her kidney to the father of one of her students. Then days later, she would be found murdered. There were no signs of trouble in the kitchen, nothing out of place in the living room, but what investigators found in Renee Pagel's bedroom was the stuff of nightmares. I would say there was uh, rage in that room. 
The 41-year-old mother of three has been stabbed multiple times while lying in her own bed recovering from a kidney donation. It was a bloody scene? It was a bloody scene. She did put up a fight. The, the struggle, in my opinion, I mean, there was blankets everywhere. There was a lamp knocked over, a clock knocked over. Um, and she had defensive wounds on her hands and on her feet uh, from obviously trying to block stabbing motions of the suspect. Unfortunately, officers weren't able to find any physical evidence pointing to her killer. But Sergeant E.J. Johnson of the Kent County Sheriff's Department says the nature of the attack itself speaks volumes. This wasn't a burglary. No one had taken anything. So, you know, in my experience of 21 years being an officer, um, it was somebody close. Somebody had something out for Renee. And if you believe Renee's friends, there was only one person who fit that bill. When I heard Chris, Renee's dead, I knew he killed her. That he, being Renee's estranged husband, Michael Pagel. Even before you found out she was stabbed, I even knew. before you found out the manner of her death, you thought he killed her? I knew. I held out the very least bit of hope for her kid's sake, that it had been a complication from the surgery, but I knew he did it. Of course, that's just speculation, and Michael vehemently denies having anything to do with the death of his estranged wife. But Renee's loved ones say their belief is based on information they got directly from Renee just before she was killed. So just hours before she had died, she was very agitated. The last words she spoke to me were, Joycey, I can't die. I can't let that get my kids in my house. Those are the very last words she ever spoke to me. Renee's friends did share these thoughts with police immediately after the murder. We spoke with Renee's father and her stepmother and friends. And the common theme from all of them was she was going through a divorce with her husband, uh, Michael, and that uh, it was pretty uh, contentious. I mean, the, the, the uh, divorce had a lot of issues. At this point, the family and the friends were pointing at Michael as a potential suspect. But even if they weren't, police always start with the people closest to the victim. So just hours after the gruesome discovery, it was time to pay Michael a visit. We went and made contact with uh, Mr. Pagel at his residence and immediately uh, wanted an attorney. So he lawyered up yes. as soon as you went to him? Immediately, yes. Which was his right, but Sergeant Johnson says it also put the focus of the investigation directly on Mike. He didn't want to know anything about her condition, didn't want to know what happened just stated that he would prefer to talk to an attorney. So he wasn't broken down? He wasn't grieving the mother of his children being dead? No, not at all. But Michael's attorney tells us police know his client is innocent and that the only reason they're focused on Michael is because they have no other leads. He adds that Michael has an absolute airtight alibi and that the reason Mike hasn't gone public himself is because the media is out to destroy him, even forcing him to move away from home. So then are Renee's loved ones letting raw emotion get the better of them? And was there anyone else who might have wanted Renee dead? Have you identified anyone else who wanted Renee Pagel out of the way or? Renee had no enemies at all. and. There were a few names that have come up. Um, for instance, there was a gentleman that lived in the pole barn. It, it was actually in an apartment next door. He was there during this incident. We interviewed him. He has jumped through every hoop that we asked and has been completely cooperative. And he says every other person of interest they've questioned has done the same. So everyone else has been cleared? That we know of, yes. Everyone, that is, but Michael Pagel. We definitely think that Michael is a definite person of interest, and many things point in his direction. He hasn't been cleared yet, um, so we're keeping everything open. Um, but at this point, you know, in a divorce that, you know, somebody's not getting what they want, that could be a potential motive um, in something like this. Uh, so, yeah, our crosshairs are on him. And Renee's friends say the reason why is obvious. What was Michael's motive? What would have been Michael's motive to kill Renee? Well, it's extremely clear to me 
I think when the judge said, Mr. Pagel, you're going to have to get a better paying job, he decided he'd have to go to plan B because he wanted everything. And plan B being murder. She had to go. And as for Michael's alibi, his attorney tells Crime Watch Daily that Michael was at his mother's house miles away that entire evening, as were all of his children. Still, Renee's friends question how true that is. Well, OJ had an alibi as well. So, from my understanding, he hasn't exactly been cooperative with the police. I would love for his mother to take a lie detector test. Perhaps he should too. If he is so innocent, why not try to clear your name? Coming up, with accusations swirling, we go looking for answers from the one man refusing to talk to police. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Michigan mother of three, Renee Pagel, was recovering from kidney donation when she was viciously stabbed to death in her bedroom. Investigators say their crosshairs are aimed right at her estranged husband, so our Narissa Knight attempted to get his side of the story. Someone took Renee Pagel's life in the most savage of ways. Now Renee's friends and family are keeping her memory alive in the only way they can. We've put up posters. We've established a website for her. We've held candlelight vigils, and we've gotten together as friends just to share stories. But they've also been accused of going too far in their efforts by very publicly and forcibly pointing the finger at Renee's estranged husband, Michael Pagel. In fact, while he won't talk to police about anything related to Renee's murder, Mike has complained to the Michigan State Police about what he calls harassment from Renee's friends. So Michael Pagel has accused you of stalking him, of harassing and him. And he did why? I think he just wants this to all go away. He, I think he wants everybody to forget that it ever happened. And as for what friends say Pagel considers harassment? Well, apparently um, Mr. Pagel was getting scripture cards in the mail, so apparently his family felt that he was being harassed. And I heard that he even had to move out of the area because he felt so harassed by these awful scripture cards. <laughs> Michigan State Police did look into Michael's claims, but say they saw nothing rising to the level that would require action. Either way, in court documents, Mike says he had to move away to protect his kids from constant accusations and media scrutiny. He has retained an attorney, which he has a right to do. He has not offered any uh, help. He has never called. He has never inquired, offered any assistance. Uh, we have gotten nothing uh, from him. Uh, and, you know, the, the mother of his three children. That's pretty bold. Well, it's pretty bold, but what I find odd, too, is, you know, his family members have not really reached out or or helped us uh, either, which is kind of weird. And with that in mind, we decided to try once more to get Michael's side of the story, not from his attorney, but from the man himself. Loved ones of Renee Pagel say Michael Pagel has moved several times since the murder of his estranged wife. We're going to his home here to see if he wants to respond to those allegations against him. Hi, how are you? Is I'm Mr. Good. Pagel home? Um, no, he's at work right now. No luck knocking on his door, so we tried to reach him by other means. We're calling now to see if Michael Pagel wants to respond to the allegations against him. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. No answer. The phone is going straight to voicemail. Then, just as we were preparing to leave, Michael pulled up and quickly hopped into another car. Excuse me, sir. Hi. Michael, do you want to just tell it, just answer uh, just one question. Just one question, sir. Michael, answer one question. Just tell us, did you kill your ex-wife? Through his attorney, Michael Pagel denies having anything to do with Renee's murder and says he's just as worried as everyone else that there's a killer out there. He goes on to say he even fears for his own safety. Do you think you've already found who killed Renee? It's very possible that we have. Is Michael Pagel still a suspect? He is definitely a person of interest and has not been cleared. 
the crosshairs in the investigation are on him. They're definitely focused on him. But police say they still need that one piece of hard evidence or someone with inside knowledge to speak up. So would you say this case is unsolved or would you say this case is unproven? It is unpunished, but in my mind, it's solved. But until police solve this case, Renee's friends say they'll do everything they can to keep fighting for closure. Many people say that it's been 11 years. Maybe it's just best to let it go at this point. What do you say to that? No, I, I say no. We need the truth to come out and we need justice. As you can see, Renee's friends are clearly not going to give up their fight for justice. And even though police named her estranged husband a person of interest, he has never been arrested and denies having anything to do with her murder. So what now? We brought in former prosecutor and criminal defense attorney Bob Bianchi to answer some questions and clear some things up. Bob, first of all, as you see, Renee's friends are pretty convinced that Mike had something to do with Renee's murder. Why do you think he's not been charged? Chris, here's the important thing. As a lawyer, as a prosecutor, you have to prove your case beyond the reasonable doubt based on the rules provided to you by the court. Two pieces of information that they're relying upon, the jury will never hear. You cannot comment on a defendant's failure to speak to the police under the Fifth Amendment or his refusal to cooperate. And secondly, there's an evidence rule that says a victim's statements about impending doom cannot be admitted. Why? Under the same Fifth Amendment that says you have a right to cross-examine statements used against you at a trial. So that only leaves the prosecutor with the motive because there's no other physical evidence connecting him to the scene. I actually had a case where somebody was murdered and all the detectives and investigators went right towards it's got to be the husband, got a negative rule in a divorce action. The divorce papers were all over the husband's house. He asserted his right to remain silent. Everybody was in the red that he was the person that did it. We interviewed a kid who on two occasions gave information. He was just a basic witness. He wasn't a suspect in the case. But a couple of us took a look at the statements of that kid and were like, there's something squirrely about this kid. At the end of the day, he gave a confession and is serving life in jail. That husband, who was being considered a suspect, in fact, was not the murderer. After Renee's death, Mike got full custody of the kids, and we're told while investigating the story, it appears they're on his side. Well, I mean, he's not convicted of a crime. He has not been charged with a crime. And so there's really nothing a court can do except give custody back to the biological parent. Bob Bianchi, as always, thank you for your insights into this case. Appreciate it. And if you know anything about Renee's death, it's time to stop protecting people and let the truth come out. You can submit a tip anonymously at CrimeWatchDaily.com or call the Silent Observer Hotline. That number is 1-866-774-2345. Up next, a beautiful young woman from the Bronx thought she had met Mr. Wright until he turned into her worst nightmare. He tried to force me to have sex with him. How she finally escaped her abuser. And the moment he came back for revenge. That would have been the bullet that killed me. Coming up. Nearly every week here on Crime Watch Daily, we cover dangerous and often deadly cases of domestic violence. And we hear a similar theme. I just couldn't find a way to get out. Well, today, in an emotional new interview, one survivor relives her violent attack hoping it will empower someone out there right now who's living in fear. Here's Pat LaLama. Avamir Duclerc cheated death by a single centimeter. I felt like this was it. I felt like he, he got me. Her own devastating Bronx tale is one of terror, domination, raging violence, and a bullet to the head. I grabbed myself like this. This was like, I, I threw myself on the floor and I, I just, I shout, help, 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 help. It's one of the most horrendous cases of domestic abuse. All of it at the hands of someone who professed his undying devotion. Everything I did was because I love you. And against all odds, Avamir Duclerc lives to tell of the physical horror of the past, the emotional scars of the present. I wake up thinking the whole world's about to end. And her courageous goals for the future. I didn't let that stop my life. Like, I had to continue. Tell me what? Yes, yes, yes. Tell me. 
Evamir Duclerc has more than a deep bond with her close girlfriends. I call her a sister. That's what she is to me, sister. I think in the 10, 12 years that we have known each other, we have never had an argument. We just clicked as soon as we like met. And no doubt her vibrant personality and stunning looks were a magnet for male attention. One man in particular was Ramon Lalandres Castillo, who worked in a neighborhood deli. Castillo, let's say, was moonstruck over the Bronx beauty. Every time I would come over here, like to the store, he would keep asking me, like, who is she? Like, can you give me her number, this and that? The ever-protective Joanna refused, but she had a plan. I was like, hey, I'm going to tell her that you've been asking about her, and I'll see what she says. And that's how it was. I found him interesting, and I went out on a date. It seemed like a match. He was very nice. He was very attentive to what Evie wanted, to what her friends wanted as well. He made us feel very comfortable. But it wasn't a perfect union. Early in the relationship, we had a couple of arguments, little arguments, but it was relationships, problems that escalated with the time. Joanna remembers a night when she was out with Evamir and Ramon. When they returned home for the evening, Joanna says Ramon became enraged when he wasn't invited in. He grabbed her by her hair, pulled her back into the car. So when he did that, I was like, no, like this is what we're not about to do. No, this is not right. I remember one day she came to my house and he literally left his car parked, double parked outside in the middle of the street for like 30 minutes and went upstairs and tried to carry her out of my house. That's when I was like, whoa, this guy is really crazy. Dynasty and Joanna were beginning to see red flags waving everywhere, especially after Evamir told them about one particular night of rage. He tried to force me to have sex with him. Um, I actually didn't want to have sex with him that night and he was so mad at the the fact that I was saying no, that he pulled me from the bed. I was wearing thongs and he actually like cut me. Despite that, for Evamir, love, as they say, was blind. She really wanted to see the good of him, so she was like, you know, we were drinking. Um, I don't think this is gonna happen again. If Evamir wasn't yet able to see the temperamental Ramon's need for control and domination, she was about to get a rude and violent awakening. Their relationship took a turn when we took a trip to Florida. It was Evamir's birthday, and she wanted to celebrate in Miami Beach, but not with anyone from the opposite sex. It was a girl's trip, it was my birthday. My friends didn't want any males around. It wasn't, you know, it was just for us to be comfortable. Ramon would have none of that. He insisted on crashing the party. So off they went to Florida, the girls and the unwelcome Ramon. That first night when we went out was the first big problem where I, I just realized who he was. We went out, we was clubbing, everything was fine. And all of a sudden he says, um, let's go upstairs in front of everybody. And I'm like, oh, let's wait. It's, you know, we're having a good time. Nobody's leaving yet. Let's just stay a little more. No, I said, let's go. Those were his reply, let's go. I said, let's go, and that's it. My response to him was, well, if you want to go ahead, go ahead, I'll meet you upstairs, but I'm not leaving now. Ramon went to the room angry, and when Evamir returned later, she would pay a brutal price. We heard the screaming from her, and we went to go, I went to go and check what was going on, and he was beating her, like the room was flipped over and she, he was in the balcony like with her his hand on her hair and pulling her and trying to choke her. He punched me, he threw me down, hit me. When I got to reach the door to pull it, he grabbed me by the purse to pull me back. He stood in the room and he was just saying he was gonna kill himself, to not call the cops, that he was gonna throw himself off the balcony. Hotel management had called 911, and within minutes, Ramon was enraged, in cuffs, and arrested. It was a moment of reckoning for Evamir and her friends. We were like, leave him there. That's it, like, this is your moment to break up with him. 
Avamir was still reluctant to cut ties, a common characteristic for victims of abuse, self-blame. She was like on denial at that point. I think um, in some kind of way, she thought maybe she triggered that. She, re she was mad, but not that mad at him. But thankfully, Evamir eventually saw the light and knew what she had to do. Coming up. It took me a couple of months to actually like get him out, out, because I never asked him to move in. It took me a while to get him out. It was just battles after fights after fights. So he was eventually out. Evamir gives Ramon the boot. He'll give Evamir something far worse in return. I did not want to raise my face because I know he wanted to, you know, if he wanted to do any damage to me, it would have been to my face. Evamir Duclerc finally had enough of her controlling boyfriend, Ramon. And after a violent fight while the two were on vacation, the native New Yorker returned home to start over. Sadly, he had other ideas. Once again, here's Pat Lalama. Evamir Duclerc was ready to break the chain of abuse from Ramon Castillo, but it wouldn't be a clean break. He had made bail in Florida after the hotel room assault on Evamir and returned to the Bronx, still a ticking time bomb. Evamir treaded carefully. My excuse to him was, we need our space in order for this to work. In typical abuser fashion, Ramon apologized repeatedly and became obsessed with winning her back. He would just buy her things, literally, like he would just buy things. Like anything you could think of, he would just get her. And I remember her telling me, like, I don't know how to get rid of him. Like, I try and he still comes. It took two agonizing months for Ramon to finally get the message. He called me, I'm still at work, and he's like, well, I'm gonna take all my stuff from my um, from the apartment, and I'm gonna leave you the keys. Avamir was now free from the grip of domestic violence, or so she thought. He went, destroyed the whole apartment, just, I had, it was November, because I already had put up the Christmas tree. There was ornaments all over, Christmas tree, a piece over there, all my clothes was out, the wardrobes, like everything was just, Broken glass, you know, broken mirrors. He glued her door to the apartment. Called the cops, made a report. He actually ended up paying for everything that he broke. And that was the end of that. He actually left my house for good. In fact, Ramon seemed to simply fly off the radar. There's no sign of this guy. Like, I haven't seen him. I've heard, you know, from friends that we have in common, he started um, to work. He was getting his cab driving license. So I'm like, hey, maybe, you know, he needed to get his life together. Hardly. Ramon was just taking a break from his reign of terror. And so it begins again. Ramon would show up to her job, to, to school, to our friend's house. Anywhere he knew that Evie was at or with a friend, he will break my lights of my car because he thought that she was using my car to go out. Avamir once again was forced to live life shadowed by a madman. We were actually like waiting for it, like, okay, something big has to happen for this to end. Every week was something with him. But Dynasty, Joanna, and even Avamir could never have predicted just how big that something would be. On a frigid January night in New York, Avamir's shift was almost over at the pharmacy where she worked in Manhattan. Her co-worker, Demetrius Johnson, makes a chilling observation. Demetrius come back and he's like, your ex is parked outside the store. Are you waiting for him? Right now, I was just like, I don't know what to expect. I haven't spoken to him. I guess I was scared, but I didn't want to show him that I was scared. So I'm like, you know what, Demetrius, just give me a second so we can both walk to the train together. He was actually taking the same train as me. We walk outside, he's nowhere to be seen. There's no cars, it's below zero and we have like a good six blocks to walk. Evamir tries to stay calm, but keeps looking over her shoulder. And suddenly what she sees is no illusion. It's a maniac on a mission. I look back and he was like rushing, like speed walking towards me and his hat was down. He had a big coat, but his hand was inside his pocket. So I look back and I'm like, let me do that sin, that sin. That's just, you know, I, I started speed walking. Like, I, I, I ran. 
Dimitris grabs him, like to stop him. And he was not trying to hit Dimitris back or trying to, he was, his, his goal was me. I threw myself on the floor and I grabbed myself like this. He's grabbing me my, by my hair, trying to pull me up, but it's not possible. Dimitris is actually forcing him and hitting him, let her go, let her go. All I feel is my head going to side to side. Evamir doesn't even realize what's happened to her. All I know is I feel this really cold, and when I actually touched it, it was a lot of blood behind my head. In an act of obsession and vengeance, Ramon Castillo pulled out a handgun and fired at Evamir, hitting her once in the arm and once in the head, the second bullet grazing her finger and lodging inches above her right ear, but she's still conscious. Ramon Castillo was determined to complete the job, but fate would take a life-saving turn when he tried to fire again. The gun jammed. Ramon turned and ran. I feel like if the gun would, nev would have never jammed on the third strike, that would have been the bullet that killed me. It was at a close distance. Avamir's story of survival has been nothing short of miraculous. She remained conscious all the way to the hospital. And doctors told Evamir that the bullet lodged in her head was just one centimeter away from killing her. Evamir believes she owes her life to her friend Demetrius, who valiantly tried to fight off Ramon. He didn't get that perfect shot because Demetrius kept moving him and forcing him and trying to, you know, punch him to get him away from me. So he never had that good angle to get what he wanted. Ramon didn't get far. He was in police custody in a matter of minutes. Cops found a suicide note in his car. I feel like he realized he messed up. I wasn't gonna give him another chance. Shooting me, maybe it was his idea of, she won't be mine, she won't be nobody else's. And even after Ramon was arrested and charged, Evamir received another love letter wrought with sorrow and begging forgiveness. Everything I did was because I love you. Ramon Castillo was convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to 15 years, but that's little comfort to anyone. I feel like he's gonna try to find me. He's gonna try to find her, some, one of us. Like, I feel like he's gonna come back for one of us. So it is scary. Like Evamir, millions of women get caught in the tangled web of abuse. Those who say, just walk away, don't understand the dynamics of domestic violence. But through her story, Avamir and her friends hope to give strength and encouragement to others locked in the same living hell. Don't think you could fight it off. Don't think you could win it off. Speak to someone. Don't be ashamed. Get the help that you need and try to get out of it alive. You can't even how you want to be treated. For Avamir, there are battle scars. I wake up panicking, thinking something's going to happen. Like, it's just. You can ask anybody, like, it's just, I wake up thinking the whole world's about to end. But those scars are symbols of survival and newfound wisdom. I got the help that I needed. I went to therapy, I did what I had to do, went back to school, I got my bachelor's degree. I didn't let that stop my life. Like, I had to continue. I had to make sure that, you know, this was not gonna set my life up. Like, this wasn't gonna be it.